Hi everyone, I'm Maud and I'm the founder of Salty Studio. Um, I'd like to welcome my guests today. You'll join me fairly soon. <laughs> there we go. So again, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Maud, I'm the founder of Salty Studio. Um, so I'm based in London. Um, I run private, corporate and public experiences as well as workshops, uh, food design projects and research and a lot more exciting things. Um, my background is mostly in design. Um, I studied a BA in sustainable product design um, at Falmouth University in Cornwall in the southwest of England. Um, and I slowly realized that I really wanted to integrate food into my design projects and even make some of them all about food. Um, and so then I found an MA, a master's in food design and innovation in Milan. So I straight away went to study that um, for a year. And I've been curious about the food design world and worked at various studios, including Tour de Cork in Milan, um, Conference Campus in Denmark, and Studio H in Cape Town. Um, and so when I returned to London after my studies, um, I felt like I really needed to express myself and to open my own little food design studio in London. Um, so this is how Storty Studio started. Um, it's been about two years now, and I've hosted many different events. Um, using food as a tool to tell stories and to elevate the sensory experience. And I love to collaborate with different people and find the richness um, from other fields, um, as you will see today. And so I'm really excited to be taking part in this year's uh, virtual Dutch Design Week um, in partnership with Isola Design District. And the name of their exhibition is uh, called Materialized. And I decided to look at this from a food design and sustainability point of view. So I titled my project with a question, um, which is, can we change? Um, and because we are increasingly becoming aware of the effects of waste pollution on this planet and for the future of uh, human population. And I really wanted to focus uh, this on uh, the packaging side of, uh, as a material and as well as look into the possibilities of edible materials um, as a food designer, this is particularly interesting. Um, so a little bit of an introduction on packaging. So most of the things that we eat um, still come packaged, uh, whether you buy vegetables at a supermarket or a juice in a carton or a pack of crisps or takeaway meal, there's always some kind of plastic in there or some material that isn't yet recyclable and will end up in a landfill for years. Um, I found a couple of stats that I think were quite interesting and um, just to realize really at what point um, this is a big issue. Um, there's 40 billion plastic utensils that are used in the US per year. Um, globally, around 8 million tons of plastic packaging enters the ocean every year. Um, there's microplastics that have been found in 90% of our table salt, which I thought was quite scary. Um, there's 1.2 billion plastic bags that are used for fruit and vegetables each year and 4.7 billion plastic straws are used per year in the UK um, and actually only a third of plastic packaging gets recycled here in the UK so I think this is again another there's the issue of waste and there's also the issue of recycling because if we really put a lot of effort in recycling stuff but it doesn't even get recycled then that's again um, another big issue and um, so why do we use so much plastic and other unsustainable materials and um, because they're economically adv advantageous um, they're lightweight, they're easy to find, hygienic and food safe. But now we're realizing obviously all the negative effects of plastic um, and these are the materials on our bodies and on our environment. Um, and many brands are really rethinking their packaging and supermarkets are slowly trying to reduce the amount of packaging um, on some of their products. And I think still in the food industry, the hygiene and food safety requirements can make it tough to change these habits. Um, so it's not easy and it's not cheap and it's often not very accessible still today even though we're still we're really talking about it a lot more so how can we challenge these issues and obstacles in order to create a more sustainable environment and um, many brands and designers are looking into edible packaging and edible materials as you'll hear about today um, and i think it's really fascinating and exciting and um, there are so many possibilities and interesting ways to develop some more sustainable ideas and I thought it'd be really interesting to highlight this. Um, so this project is more about raising awareness about what still needs to be done. Um, I think we're in the right path and it's, it's quite exciting time for innovative design within the food industry. So I'd like to introduce um, all our speakers today. So maybe Alice, if you want to start, just a short intro, uh, introduce yourself. 
Um, so I'm Alice Potts and I'm sort of a biofabric material developer. Um, I'm based in London and I sort of develop biofabrication. So I look at the idea of how we can use food waste and um, basically plants to develop new materials in a sort of sustainable approach and sort of do that through architecture, fashion and other sort of design interdisciplinary approaches. Amazing. And um, what about you, Joanna? Yeah, my name is Johanna and I'm a strategy design lead at Space 10 and I'm located in Copenhagen and Space 10 is a research and design lab that's uh, funded by and totally dedicated to IKEA. Um, so we're looking at future solutions that are affordable, acceptable and sustainable um, for the many people you would say. And my background's in climate policy and econometrics. So this topic of sustainability is very near and dear to my heart. Amazing. And um, what about you, Maxim? Hi, I'm Maxim, or better known as Mr. Trudels, and we're saying pasta la vista to soggy paper and plastic straws <laughs> with our pasta straws, a little center strudel, and basically they're 100% biodegradable, one hour strong flavorless. So it's a great compromise to fight, uh, like fight the uh, plastic challenge. Perfect. Um, and you, Laura? Hi, hi everyone. Everyone, um, yes, I'm uh, I'm what some people call me a futures lifestyle detective, but with a view on on materials innovation mainly. Officially, I'm the director of Elisaba Research, a research department of a design and engineering school here in Barcelona. Um, I'm the director of the master in design through new materials as well in in the school. And I'm also partnered together with Polimi and Matter Limited from London on the European project material designers. My background is kind of hybrid. Um, I did a PhD in material science, physics of materials, and, and then I went on to study design, uh, product design. And I have worked uh, both in think tanks like WGCN, uh, Pantone Color Planner, as well as industry, like Inditex, so I felt what it was to, to be in a change of pro chain of production and also i'm very active in the academic level of, of course and that's mainly it amazing so you've got a really interesting panel today um and so during this talk we're just going to ask a few questions uh, to our different speakers um regarding their sort of specific industry because i think they're all fairly different um but linked obviously uh, very well together and how they feel that uh, things will be in the near future so I'll start with Maxime from Strudels. Um, so I know we spoke about uh, your opinions regarding sustainability and the product that you make, which are obviously straws made of pasta, so I've got mine here as well. <laughs> um, so I don't know if some of you have tried these straws yet, but they're really interesting, they're really solid, they last a long time, um, and Maxime will tell you a bit more. But I thought that what was really interesting when we spoke about these is for you, it's more about the the fun side of the experience, uh, less about the sustainability. More, I mean, more in the sort of the way that you market your product. Um, and I think that actually, I thought that was really interesting because in a society where we consume so much every day, how is it possible to change everyone's habits? It's it's just not possible. Um, many products on the high street are bought by people who aren't really that aware about the issues, or maybe they are, but they just don't really doesn't really reflect in the way that they uh, shop. Um, and they don't really, they're not really aware of all the issues that their actions can lead to. Um, but actually, perhaps this is exactly the place where change needs to happen, um, but actually in a really subtle way. So maybe if you can tell us a little bit more about your brand positioning and why it might be a little bit different uh, to what people might expect. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, exactly. So, I mean, I'm of a very strong belief that I that there is like the big power and that ripple effect, and, like having like millions and millions of people of doing things imperfectly, like whether it's sustainability, sustainable choices, zero waste, um, rather than like a handful of people doing it perfectly, because I mean, the power is in the masses. And um, just like, it can be as easy as basically strudling, kind of like doing a change once at a time so that's why from uh, like the positioning like i'm not a straw company like we're creating like a strudels movement and just trying to inspire people how easy it is to make small sustainable changes so all our messaging is very kind of like fun as you said yourself happy if you look at our instagram it's, it's turtles 
so it's funny memes. Um, so there's a few serious messages in there, but then like my, I feel the deliveries instead of preaching and telling people how bad they are, like we find it much more effective to do it in a more fun fun uh, uh, form, and then suddenly to create that stereotype of sustainability can be fun. And like I have then this other theory of like those touch points. So again that like we can be that one touch point and maybe afterwards like um that, that will make that change that like subconsciously will people will realize something so seeing a strudel in their drink when they're out in their bar like it will force them to think rather than seeing an ad seeing like uh, like hearing uh, something from the movie and so on and then maybe that uh, like lay, later on a year after or maybe another touch point Next time they are, let's say in the um, supermarket, they'll take the cucumber not wrapped in plastic. So that's why, like, like I'm just trying to to get that message, the same the same message a lot of people are doing, and it's right doing it from different angles. But from our experience, like, it's much easier that way. And like, it showed last year went viral across the world, from Chile to uh, Guatemala, like India, Europe, like across all the big papers, they all wrote about it. So it clearly works, but, but they wrote about the fun message about it. And then the secondary message is sustainability. And I think it's a very fun approach that I feel also more brands need to be trying. Um, because I mean, this guy basically, it's very approachable, very fun, it makes people smile. And that, that's all I want. And then subconsciously let the magic happen. Like, like so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stop because I go on my ages. And yeah, so that, that's kind of like the approach that we're taking. Exactly, and I think I think that's a really interesting uh, positioning, and I think it's definitely something that brands should really uh, look into a bit more because I think the the issue is we, a lot of people are already aware, and there are a lot of people who are already making changes, but we have to convince those who are not yet aware about all of this, or we don't think that they need to change much um, to their habits. Yeah, and I think the other thing is like basically like everyone knows that plastic is bad. Like and we've heard it from all all angles. We don't need to rub it in. But like no one knows what to do. I think obviously so it's about those small changes. Exactly. And why did you choose pasta then as a material? Um, it was just it all just basically all happened like uh, it was sort of serendipity. I was basically came across it. I was in the right mindset. I was just like amazed of like how 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 it convinced me and basically how easy um, and how simple how, because I guess it's the simplicity. I mean, just wheat and water. It's something like uh, well, it's natural. Uh, you can eat it. You can drum with it. Like animals love it. Kids love it. Adults love it. So I think it's that simplicity. And, but then again, for me, this is just the first channel. So as a brand, um, I want to um, show people that uh, you don't have to compromise. But living sustainable doesn't mean you have to compromise. So the idea is like, obviously, once I get my brand established, get my message across, it's going to be other products following. Um, not necessarily from pasta, because everyone asks also what so pasta cutlery is next. Um, to be honest, rather not, rather just other products that are not compromising. Because again, I'll have established myself. Of, like people will know all strudel stuff is easy to implement. It's fun, happy. So, so that's what I'm trying to do. So this is just the first channel. It was just like the easiest. And like and since you know, like there was the turtle with the plastic straw in his nose. It's just like like the straw as a communication tool is probably the easiest now because everyone there's many of them used like a lot of them use them and like people can associate with them cutlery is something again it's not people don't hit with it like on a day-to-day -day basis whereas everyone goes out well in current times less but like people used to go out more often often so you get a straw at least once twice a week so yeah exactly so i think it's a yeah great place to start at least <laughs> um Great, and then we'll go to Laura. Um, so as a university lecturer, you've obviously probably seen uh, many innovative uh, student projects, as this is a space where the most crazy ideas happen before we have to go back to the sometimes more difficult uh, reality with budgets and manufacturing and time challenges. Um, these are definitely some moments that I really enjoyed when I was at university as well. We had no limits on the uh, breadth of the innovations we wanted to create. Um, and now you're head of the Elisava research uh, department, and you also took part in the materials trends forum in 2015. I saw, um, and so as a partner of the materials designers, um, you must see a lot of in the innovation and disruptive uh, content coming up. 
um, as a, with a focus on sustainability um, as it becomes more and more notable and uh, necessary. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering how uh, have materials evolved since that forum uh, in particular, and so just five years ago, um, and what are the main focuses when looking at materials now and designing for the future? Um, if you can tell us as well a bit more about uh, some particularly interesting materials that you've seen uh, that are either including edible materials, edible ingredients, um, or even food waste, because I think that's something else that I've seen quite a lot, um, with like eggshells and different things. Um, and do you feel that the packaging industry is going the right way? Oh, there's a lot to say about <laughs> three questions. Um, I'll start with the first one. If, if I've seen an evolution, of course, there's been a huge mm -hmm. evolution in these five years. Um, uh, I can explain like the, the four new ways that I'm seeing it. Uh, one is uh, driven by the concept of scarcity, right? A lot, a lot, a lot of experimentation with waste, no mm -hmm. waste, etc. But we've seen a resurgence of the experimental approach of design together or alongside the experimental uh, approach of science. So design um, is tackling at this scarcity from a creative perspective and generating new experimental ideas that can be fun and then later on scaled up. Um, a second driver, I think, is wellness. Uh, we've seen the resurgence mm -hmm. of more emotional materials. Um, so it's not about mainly sustainability of, of the planet, but sustainability of mm -hmm. our emotions and our well-being. I think that's an important driver. Not mentioning, obviously, uh, clean materials or cleanable materials, etc. That's something else, but the emotional side of materials. Mm -hmm. I think there's a big, huge change of what smart means. Because uh, five years ago, we, we thought smart as mainly like the technical part of, of materials, like um, face, um, face changing materials, etc., etc. But I think now the smartness is more linked to nature. The, the, the smartness within nature than the smartness within the technological hard environment. And that links to the fourth one, which is uh, um, the one with more in symbiosis with nature, even domesticating nature, um, working with bacteria, enzymes, uh, all this world of biology that Alice knows better than me. Um, mm -hmm. But I think this is, this is a, a really a great um a great path not only for materials but i think like uh, for slow tech development and and redefining what smart means from a, our human perspective so that's the evolution i think for a path different paths um then in terms of new ingredients or things um i've seen eggshell for several years now there are many many projects in that sense but uh, I think it's important to understand if we're talking about from waste, right? Food waste, I'm talking food mm -hmm. waste, or before waste, because there are many materials that are done or can be developed before we, we, we go into the food chain, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are two channels for food waste. Um, and always having this systemic perspective of food waste. Uh, it, there's also... Uh, things that are linked to socioeconomic aspects that uh, we need to consider also when developing materials or, or, or using this, this raw uh, these waste materials or raw materials before waste. But some interesting projects, I, I can mention, um, I've selected some mm -hmm. uh, from the master in, in, in design training materials. There's a project by Marnie Bowman. She used um, the oyster shell waste from their Canadian um, local setting. And she generated through a slow process, um, uh, so through a slow process, really in symbiosis with the, the local um, environment, um, a great material that it's solid that can be even treated as marble, like a, a lux lux luxury material. I think that's a positioning that's really important too. It's not only the material, how you position the material in the same way that Maxime is doing. How you, what kind of other messages are you giving to sustainability? Well, you can have the layer of luxury, right? Of, of things that you want to have and that are sustainable. Then from material designers project, European project that is almost about to finish, uh, that I invite everyone to follow the Instagram and that in the Isola district, there's uh, two projects that are issued from, from there. 
I can say, for instance, um, one of the winners, the best startup potential winner, uh, the Studio Lab, let me say it well, Lab La Bla, mm -hmm. were working with bread, bread to make mm -hmm. a solid material. So it's really, really, really interesting. And they are developing, they're already startups, so they, they, they can make a change with this perspective on, on bread as something that can be built into bricks even. So that's really interesting. And there was another curious project using from uh, Bianca Strach using uh, chewing gum. Mm. Uh, I mean, there's there's some commercial products or uh, trying to be commercial products using chewing gum as a food sole, uh, have, sorry, a shoe sole. So mm. I think it was really interesting and, 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 and curious at least. And, and it relates to a more um, not direct or familiar issue with people, right? Because people are the ones that need to buy and understand these things. And then um, another material for food packaging uh, with a gel-like form, uh, which is issued from avocado seeds and avocado waste. So really, really interesting. So it's important to also to understand that it's not only the ingredient, like what kind of food waste you're using, but what's the shape of it? Is it a foil that can be used for as packaging, uh, like covering? Is it a brick type of material? Is it a foam for packaging and that is also needed? Like we've seen a lot of foils around from potato starch, etc. But we haven't seen that many foams. So I think foams as uh, from food waste as packaging material should also be considered. That's the second question uh, you asked me. And the third one, uh, if the food packaging industry is, uh, is uh, going the right way, I think it is. At least the driver is there, at least in the collective imaginarium of people. Um, we have the plastic free movement, so that helps us, uh, help the packaging industry or uh, forces them to make changes in terms of legal things, which are the key thing normally for things to happen or to be industrialized. So I don't think it's it's in a bad positioning um, because we've seen, and if you go to the supermarket, even in, in Netherlands, there's um, this supermarket that has a plastic free aisle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I wouldn't say, but there's more to be, there's more to be done, obviously. Um, in that sense, I think it's important to understand that uh, innovations in the food packaging industry don't need to always come from a scientific technological center, that the spark for new ideas can come from the, the designer's perspective, mm -hmm. connecting things that we didn't think of, understanding the social economical um, impact. So having the systemic view is really important. And maybe that can be the seed for later on, upscale it into the food packaging industry. I think that's a, a really important driver for, for, for companies to be more innovative, uh, to incorporate this design or material design perspective. One, one, I think the food packaging industry is more mature than uh, as compared to the retail, online retail in packaging industry, where we have um, a lot of things to do in there, like polyspan and all these types of materials. Mm -hmm. But I think the food industry has the muscle and mainly has the perspective, the information, the, the society, society is informed. So that's a big, big driver for change. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what else. Mm -hmm. If I answered everything, uh, there's- Yeah, definitely. Else. I think it was super interesting to hear about this. I think it's, there's a lot of really interesting trends um, that we can see. And I think it's, yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of innovation uh, happening. Um, so I think it's, yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the next few years. Um, I think, like you said, now that the society is, now that we are all aware of all of this, um, and I think the this edible material innovation, I think is uh, is definitely, it's fairly new, I think, in some way, but I think it's definitely picking up. Um, and I've seen a lot of, uh, yeah, companies and stuff that are looking into, yeah, using edible materials as their own packaging. Um, if I can add to that, I think it's also important to, um, talking about food packaging industry, is, is, I think it's also important to understand what packaging is, mm. uh, what is it used for, and how we can 
rethink uh, again what this means. And, and in that sense, um, there's this project, oh, the OHO water bottle, mm. which is not a water bottle, yeah. it's an sphere. I had contacted that, them, not glad to join us today, but they oh, were okay. Because I, I, yeah. I always talk about them because I feel it's a really solid mm -hmm. project, um, disruptive. Like, I mean, it's not about, it's not, I think mm -hmm. of a bottle, it's something that is rigid, mm -hmm. it's something that is flexible, and I, there's no waste, not even from the packaging. So I mm -hmm. think we need disruptive solutions. We think yeah. the whole packaging thing. Uh, so for those who don't know, Oho, it's uh, a small seaweed uh, sort of pouch and it has a liquid in it so you can have it with water or any other kind of liquids. Um, so their technology is, uh, so the company is called Notpla, um, they rebranded the, the, their company recently. Um, and they, the idea is they have the technology to make it um, and then they want to try and distribute this to, and they've done it already for a lot of uh, sporting events in particular. Um, where maybe you get lots so much uh, plastic waste, plastic bottles given out to all the, for example, marathon runners, um, and there they would just give out these tiny pouches, and then you just eat eat them directly. So there's no package, there's no waste packaging waste, uh, which I think is really interesting. And I actually remember seeing the first uh, their first um, prototypes um, a while ago in Milan uh, doing a, a big uh, yeah food fair. Uh, well, I think it was three years ago or something, I, and it was really interesting to see that. I think they were fairly, yeah, fairly innovative and really disruptive. I think in the in the packaging industry definitely, um, and in the water industry as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how how far they go. Mm. Um, so then we want to hear about uh, Alice. Um, so as I was looking through your work, um, and you speak about the interconnection between biology and materiality, um, which I found really interesting. Um, and as human beings and therefore as biological matter, um, we share this planet with other living organisms, uh, animals and plants. Um, and we are creating these materials that will exist on the planet that we live on. So in the sense we are obviously um, interconnected naturally. Um, so you also talk about collaborating with others uh, for a new sustainable future. And I find it's really fascinating as well, um, because I also feel that it, so much innovation comes from collaborations, um, as you can see today. Um, I think it's everyone's got really their uh, specialities or their um, expertise in different industries. Um, and I think that by connecting all these different expertise, um, I think it's this is literally this is really how we are going to um, drive more innovation. Um, so, could you explain a little more about this connection between biology and materiality? Um, what materials you actually use, um, and how you use your collaborations to bring attention to the ecological issues that we have today? So, I sort of like um, I'm basically everything I sort of do is inspired by nature, <laughs> but I in the last um, five years have been working in the idea of like biomateriality and biodesign. And I was very lucky, like my background is in chemistry and fashion. And I was very lucky to sort of come across the biodesign challenge um, five years ago, where I was basically put in this scenario where I got put into teams of people in all disciplines. And that's what really sort of stemmed my idea of like how actually we're very used to receiving a material and then making products out of it. But actually, when we learn about a material, the way that everything is combined and how they are compact is actually synthetically replicated from a natural source. And I found all of that side very, very interesting. And actually the whole idea of what we learn and why we develop a material is inspired by nature itself. Whether we look at why a plant is waterproof, why um, an animal's fur keeps it warm or how it expels air out, we then synthetically replicate that man-made and I think what is the biggest change, especially in the last couple of years, is that we have this technology that maybe we didn't have 50 years ago, where we can actually start using fungi, algae, bacteria, these old traditional methods with our newer traditional methods to basically bio mimic these new materials. So I've sort of been working in that discipline for the last uh, five years and I, have two materials that I develop. One is um, Perspire, which was over the last five years, I worked with Imperial College in London to basically um, 
allow me to take human sweat and create that into a biocrystal. So it was for me a like a really important part of trying to get people to become sustainable because I think the one way for me to get people's attitudes to change is to almost remind people of themselves and actually remind them how amazing their bodies are. So like sweating, for example, is a bodily function that we all take for granted, but actually it can heal wounds. It tells you every like everything from your lifestyle to environmental factors. And we've been testing it for things like diabetes, cystic fibrosis and get, like various cancers. So for me, like getting people fascinated by their body was an implication of how we can get them fascinated by nature and asking all these questions again. And then the bioplastics that I've been developing, which was basically looking at this idea of how I can create a material within a certain location. So a lot of the stuff I've been doing is traveling around the world and actually looking at what is growing and what is a waste product there and looking at how we can create this new design system of where we have maybe um, products which are using technology open source. So whether that's handbags, sequins, um, we've been doing chairs, like how you do that, but then each country has their own waste issue and, and um, plants and flowers and how you can use them to then develop the material to make these products. And I think it's been, for me, it's been just like a massive, um, a massive game changer to understand like what, basically what a material can be and like how it fits into our society. And I think I've only just realized that actually I've learned to accept that there's a great possibility in interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And I think that's what I try and bring within my collaborations is that a lot of the stuff I do is quite mixed from working with fashion brands, um, working with architectures, is like trying to get them to understand the introduction of working with engineers and scientists and like actually trying to get people to understand as well that it's okay not to have all the answers, but actually having a beginning concept and working alongside someone who has that knowledge, but may have not come up with the original point can then work together to then make basically these whole new materials. I think the whole movement of it, especially since I've sort of graduated my masters, like there's just been such a, such like a beginning growth of biomaterials like even when I went back to my old MA like people I think people are finally moving forward in the sense of being okay to make these materials which do take a lot longer than normal products but actually having no fear to enter this unknown area and I think that's what's the most exciting is that people are starting to work together to challenge these ideas of what a material can be and for me biomaterials and food packaging has basically always interlinked like I think with the biodegradable element of a material there's this whole idea of like understanding what food is so a lot of the um, bioplastics I make are actually food based because I had to sort of talked with you the other day whereas like um, I think especially in London we plastic cover everything like every vegetable every fruit every food is covered in a plastic and I think for me like I don't I actually think plastic is an amazing material and I think it's allowed us to do amazing things like travel to space go deep to diving and with everything going on allow us to have our ventilators but I think that's where it should stay like these this plastic is like an innovation material we don't need for single use. And I think that's where we start making our change is that actually we leave these man-made products for their specific designated use, but we start bringing in sustainable alternatives into the sort of everyday system, into our consumer. And I think that's what's so interesting is that pack food packaging has the opportunity where it's actually like, why do we need a material that lasts forever for food that doesn't last forever? And I think actually once we start thinking about what food is, like there's the whole opportunity with some of the people that I'm working with where it's like, if you have bananas, the skin is not eaten. So actually, is there a way that we can use the skins to make this new material to cover and package them? 
and also like how do we use a natural plant's way of surviving for a longer period of time and absorbing and um, exerting out carbon and oxygen to make this packaging last longer and I think that's what's been the most exciting is that how do we get these problems and look for a natural solution to combine them together Mm, definitely. I've actually seen a recipe recently where you can eat the banana skin, so you can make it into a sort of um, a slowed, uh, like slow cooked uh, pulled pork um, vegan version. So, which I need to try at some point. Um, but I think again, it's yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, really interesting uh, things that you've said, um, and I think it'll be yeah really interesting to see how yeah what projects you're going to be working on um, in the next few years. Um, and how do you feel, yeah, how do you feel that this will, um, I think, affect how do you see the, the sort of food packaging industry in the next few years? I think compared to a lot of other industries, food packaging is actually a lot more, um, sort of what Laura said, that it's a lot more further than most. Because I think there's, I think there's like a very sort of two base materials that are used and they are not always meant to be last forever. So you have your card, your cardboard and your plastic. And I think food packaging has the chance to really push forward first the idea of using sustainable packaging. And I think it's already started happening, which I think is really, really exciting where people are starting to make like mycelium who are making mycelium packaging. Um, other people like, um, God, I've forgotten their name. Um, we, some of my friends are open cell. Speed Lip are doing the um, mycelium packaging. I think they're doing that. And I think, like, I think they have, like, food packaging has the opportunity to lead an example for the rest of the rest of the industries. Like, I, I predominantly try to stay in fashion because I feel like fashion is the furthest behind, <laughs> and I feel like I'm really trying to even more just educate people in that industry what a material is. But I think if like food packaging, which has already started compared to others can really push forward, I think the other industries will start realizing and start moving forward as well. Definitely. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the your sequins that you've made? Because I thought they were quite interesting. So um, I actually started, um, I'm working with a company at the moment, but the sequins are all basically based um, within a five kilometer radius of wherever I live, but they're all made from um, seaweed, um, which is like extracted from this like red seaweed on the Cornish coast. And all of the pigments are made of dehydrated flowers that have been completely seasonal. So what I've been like really interested in is that actually we're always inspired by nature physically, but actually how do we basically go around and be like, I like that color and actually extract its natural pigments. So I've been sort of working on my own and with um, Imperial again to like look at how we can actually use the colors that inspire us naturally instead of synthetically replicating them, but also how we use nature's natural colors during those seasons and get inspired by that instead of completely controlling what a color is. Mm. It's really fun, <laughs> a lot of foraging. <laughs> I look forward to seeing more of that then. <laughs> um, and so finally, we've got uh, Joanna from Space 10. And um, so as you've explained earlier, the team at um, IKEA's Space 10 uh, Research and Design Lab have been looking into the future of food um, quite a bit recently. And they state that on the, um, they're on a mission to create a better everyday life for people and the planet. Um, and I remember seeing the Future Meatball uh, project. The concept was really interesting. Um, There's an interesting look into the future and actually now present, because a lot of these, um, if you have a look at the different meatball um, propositions, a lot of them are sort of happening already. Um, and so it's just an interesting look into what the future and the present um, of food might look like. Um, and so I'm really interested to see uh, how you feel about packaging. Um, and how uh, packaging can be part of our daily life without us realizing it, um, and how materials can affect um, the quali our quality of life and the devastating consequences um, on our environment. Um, so how do you see the future of packaging um, in the next few years, and what kind of trends uh, do you think will be most prominent um, in the edible materials field? Yeah. 
Um, I really see the, the future of packaging in twofold, and these are both areas we've explored at Space 10. The first being, of course, materials. Um, edible materials are, are really fascinating, as well as uh, biocomposite materials or really readily uh, recyclable materials. Um, I actually think, Maxim, your example of the straw is a great example because it's so beautifully simple. You know what pasta is. You know that it's uh, biodegradable and you can easily get rid of it. Um, and so we've looked at some of those materials. Um, like you mentioned, Alice, we've looked at mycelium. Um, we've also looked at vegetable fibers um, as different types of packaging materials. Um, but of course, there are those, uh, there are different challenges with how might they actually be sustainable. A, a packaging that the material might actually be sustainable, but the binder to keep the material might not be uh, recyclable. So there are still a lot of challenges within the, the materials field. Um, but from my perspective, that looks like where the short term, um, a lot of the innovation will come in materials. I think the, the other side of the packaging innovation is looking at systems and how we even think about our food system, how we think about purchasing our food. And that's something that we've also um, looked into from different angles. Um, but to, to speak more clearly to what systems might be, that might be instead of uh, at some supermarkets uh, around the world, you see that all of the produce is fresh or not fresh, but unpackaged and you bring your own bag and you're purchasing the produce or you're purchasing the dry goods. Um, and so those are small steps into thinking about how we even purchase differently. Another example would be the food delivery boxes that just deliver a crate full of fresh produce um, that's at least available here in Copenhagen. Um, but then it's also thinking about uh, packaging from a systems perspective. So we're also, we also have looked into parametric design, um, thinking about how design can be uh, a little bit more standardized so that when you do have packaging for one thing that it can very easily be used, reused for packaging for another thing. So while that might not be able to really fix the problem of having a totally circular packaging system, it can at least extend the life of, of packaging. Um, so that's, how I see the, the future of packaging uh, generally, I think the, the edible um, packaging specifically, as I said, I think Maxim is is right on. Um, a lot of people know that, uh, you know, sustainability is a, a huge issue and the climate crisis is, is really at hand. Um, but we've all heard the, the facts. We all know that the world's going under. So I don't think people need that, uh, you know, gloom and doom perspective. What they're really looking for is an opportunity um, and they're looking for a more bright and also playful future. And so how do we share that vision? Um, I think that's what will really inspire people to, to move forward. And in the context of edible packaging, um, I think, again, Max, and you're spot on. That's the, that's the way we need to point people towards to something they understand can relate to. Definitely. I think, again, lots of really interesting points. I think the, <laughs> the supermarket side of things as well, I think it's, Again, if some of you have been in different countries, I think it's even between the UK, so I'm half French as well, so I go back to France quite a bit. Um, and it's just impressive to see the difference between what we have and how things are displayed in supermarkets. Um, like Alice pointed out, in the UK, it's everything is all packaged in plastic, even you know, cucumbers, bananas, everything. I think, especially at the moment, um, I guess there's a lot of more regulations um, around food hygiene and safety. Um, but in France, there's still, there's already the plastic bags for uh, vegetables and fruit, they're often compostable or biodegradable. Um, I don't know exactly at what point, um, but there's already uh, that in place or paper packaging um, and most of the fruit and vegetable is just laid out like that and you just pick it. Um, so, and I've seen that in most huge supermarkets. So I don't understand, I still don't understand why it's not happening yet in the UK. But yeah. again, I think each country is slowly, hopefully getting there. Um, but it's, yeah, it's interesting to see what's happening in, in different countries. How is it? How totally is it right that uh, the, the current moment has really given a huge blow to a lot of the innovation and materials mm -hmm. and the way that we purchase things. I think people are scared of what the, the pandemic means for their lives. And so that sort of inspires a that tendency to move back to what is known and what's familiar. And unfortunately for packaging, that's plastic and cardboard. So how, how is it in, in Copenhagen? Because I feel like I think Denmark is slightly is very sustainably aware. Um, is that just a sort of an, uh, what I think or, or is it actually um, uh, how it's happening? 
Well, we definitely like to think that we're we're sustainably aware, but uh, who knows how true that is in reality. Um, but I think just again that example of um, of going to the grocery store, um, we had a bunch of what would be directly translated as as loose markets, where everything is totally loose. You buy in bulk, or you buy just for what you need. Um, and as a sidebar, you know, there's another add to that. If you're just buying what you need, there's a reduction of food waste potentially there. Um, but unfortunately, with concerns about health and hygiene, a lot of these loose markets have had to close because uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about how the, the coronavirus spreads. Um, but in, in terms of Copenhagen, there's a lot of, or in Denmark as a whole, there's a lot of emphasis and focus on sorting and recycling properly and also being more conscientious about the packaging um, that we use. Definitely. Um, I think it's also something else that you pointed out, which was interesting, is how actually sustainable are some materials. Um, so I, at university, I remember studying the idea of embodied energy as well. So it's a material that might be uh, very easy to, <coughs> that might biodegrade very easily, might actually, there might be a lot of energy put into it to even create it in the first place. Um, and I remember seeing actually at the Space Center, I, I went there, um, I think about a year or two ago, um, and I remember seeing a note uh, saying, uh, well, saying about the avocados not being uh, very sustainable, actually. And a lot of people weren't aware about that. So you were not serving avocado on taste, um, as a lot of people would uh, would like to have. Um, and I think that's really interesting, to that we, I think, not just look at the potential materials, but look at further. And because some of these materials might create even more waste or might actually not uh, be as transparent um, as we think so yeah and I think even when a material is sustainably made or comes from sustainable sources or is even technically recyclable or reusable um, there is still a gap in the last step from a consumer purchasing something to being able to recycle it so as an example in Copenhagen I think almost all pizza places have a standardized pizza box um, that's in theory recyclable it might even be bio compost compostable um, but it's really only compostable in a compost center. It's not compostable in your own personal compost. Um, so that's a huge blocker right there between, you know, you've invested all of this energy um, into creating a material that in theory is, is sustainable, um, but it's not getting there to that, uh, that last step. And even this is happening even in London. So I used to live in Hackney um, where you have, there's a, there was a huge uh, movement to put in uh, compost bins. So we all have compost bins everywhere. Um, and then I've just moved back to uh, Kensington and Chelsea, where it's a bit more of a wealthier neighbourhood. And yet there aren't any of these compost bins, which is just for me ironic. It's just a bit silly. But and so even within a city, there are different uh, measures that have been put in place that aren't equal everywhere. And um, so I think it just gives people different uh, unequal access uh, to this, um, which I think even makes it harder um, for everyone. So and I know, I know people even even some. That. Sustainable material. That's the thing about sustainable materials is it doesn't matter if they're sustainable if they're not accessible and affordable to the majority of the population. Mm, exactly, and and like I've said before as well, like the uh, there's a huge part of uh, recycled things that we will we put in our recycling bins in the UK, which aren't actually even recycled. So I think there's a lot of a lot of things that need to be rethought. Um, but hopefully, I think if uh, well, I think having these discussions are definitely uh, helping. And I think we're slowly going on the right path. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining this talk. Um, I don't know if some of you had any questions. I don't think we can have live questions. Um, but if, if any of the, uh, the speakers you want to ask each other some questions. Well, thank you, everyone, anyway, for joining. I think this is a really interesting uh, panel discussion um, on the future of packaging and edible materials. Um, thank you to the Easy Light Design District as well for her hosting this. Um, and yeah, hopefully see you soon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.